Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again. I can see there's lots of you logged on, eagerly awaiting the episode number 23 of the Lowestoft History Sessions with Ivan Bunn. My name is Paul, and myself and Stephen of the Voice Cloud and the Rogue Shanty Chorus have been uh, presenting these Lowestoft History Sessions throughout this year, throughout the lockdown and uh, socially distant epidemic season that we faced in 2020. Ivan has presented lots of different talks on a, v a variety of subjects, uh, really, really incredibly fascinating themes and topics throughout these sessions. This is the last one, I'm afraid. Uh, now, we are hoping to bring something uh, new in the in the new year, sometime in the new year, uh, which will feature Ivan and, uh, and, and lots of different uh, history subjects. We haven't quite worked it out yet because we're, we're still aiming to get some funding. It, with that in mind, I would urge you all, if you're willing, to drop us a message or an email at contact at thevoicecloud.co.uk or just here, right here on our Facebook page, you could like our page and send us a message through the messaging service. To that end, that would be great if you could just put into words, just a few words, how much these sessions have meant to you. If they've sparked an interest in local history, perhaps you're uh, local to Lowestoft, perhaps you're not, and perhaps you've found them fascinating and interesting anyway, despite not being local, or perhaps you're local and have moved away. But any kind of words, any kind of testimonial that you could give us that we could try to entice some, some funders with, that would be fantastic. And what that would do for us, it would mean that we can show that the impact that Ivan and these history sessions have made in order to, as I say, gain some funding for something a little bit different next year. Once again, we really do thank you so much for all of your support and your loyal um, your loyal viewership. It's, it's been an incredible year, I'm sure, for everybody. And it has really been, well, it's made a difference to me. I'm sure it has to Ivan and Stephen as well, just to be able to present something to, to, to people out there. And all of your comments have shown just how actively engaged and interested you've been in these sessions. It's been wonderful for us. And, and from all that you've said, it seems like it's been wonderful for you. As I said, please don't despair. We are really aiming to bring you something in the new year. What it is and what shape it will take, we're not sure yet until we find the right level of funding in order to maintain that. And any any kind of uh, written contribution that you can make to us via our message page or emailing us at contact at thevoicecloud.co.uk to support that would be invaluable. So once again, thank you very much. I'm going to go straight to some comments because already people are tuning in. S such a person is Chris Collins. She says, evening, Stephen, Paul and Ivan. She's given us a little kiss there, which is cheeky, but very welcome. And Linda Boy says, hi, Stephen, Paul, Ivan and everyone. Merry Christmas, one and all. And of course, I was almost forgetting Christmas is upon us, uh, whether we're ready or not. So that's fantastic, isn't it? Uh, Jackie Draper of, of Barry and Jackie Draper fame. She says, evening all. Good evening to Barry and Jackie. Lovely to see that you're with us tonight and about to watch episode number 23 of the Lowestoft History Sessions. Jerry Paul says, hello all. Can't believe it's the last one. No, it certainly has crept up on us. And um, as I said, we're, we're, we'll be fighting hard to to make sure that something else is 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 offered uh, featuring Ivan and uh, who knows what else who knows who else in the coming in the coming year of 2021 uh, we'll do all that we can rob haylock says good evening and merry christmas from tier 4 well rob if it's a merry christmas in tier 4 <laughs> um well good for you to keep it merry when you say tier four and tier three and tier two and tier one if there is such a thing still it almost makes it sound like hunger games doesn't it um if you've seen that like you're in district four thanks for these sessions really enjoyed them says rob learning a little bit about my hometown during these depressing months has been real highlight well thank you rob that's a, a lovely thing to say thank you chris collins says it mustn't be and i agree we must make sure to um to bring you something else Diana Carver says, good evening all. Once again, looking forward to the evening. Thank you, Di. Lovely, lovely lady. And thank you for your support. Now, I'm just going to uh, give you a word from our sponsors so far. Uh, before I do, this this evening's 
uh, presentation from Ivan is entitled Connections, the Man with the Pistols. Now, I'd love to give you a little teaser, but Ivan knows that I'm a blabbermouth and he hasn't told me much at all about it. So I'm, I eagerly anticipate tonight's episode as much as I know you all do. Um, don't worry, it'll be upon us in no time at all. But as I said, all I... All I really need to do is to say thank you for the support that we've had from the lovely people at People's Health Trust. You can see their logo just here. We are funded through the Health Lottery East. People's Health Trust have funded us, Stephen and I, from the Rogue Shanty Chorus. They have funded us throughout this lockdown period, the epidemic period, and prior to that, for a whole year uh, prior to that. Now, the Lurse of History Sessions is a part of the cultural and musical heritage of the east coast of Lowestoft and Waveney. And it's it's funded through the Active Community Programme. Now, they have enabled us to work with people of all ages, from two years old to 90 years young, those enjoying music or perhaps history in these cases, whether they're just beginning on their love of music or history, or perhaps they're accomplished musicians, or they've had a keen interest in in the family history or local history, wherever wherever they are in their journey, we've been we've been very lucky to have been funded to help and to work with them via People's Health Trust. So we thank them greatly uh, for all that they've done, and um, perhaps they'll fund us again. But if if not, um, as I said, we are actively looking for some more funding. If you know of of, of any kind of um, open community fund or a heritage fund or anything like that, that you think might be worth us putting an application into, uh, please do let us know as you get in touch with us via the message page or on our email. We'd, we'd, we'd dearly love suggestions. Uh, we've got we've got a few ideas already, so don't despair. But any, any, um, any further suggestions would be very, very welcome indeed. So, as I said, we are from the Rogue Shanty Chorus, Stephen and I, and... The road shanty course look a little bit like this on a good day. Now, this is the the, the most of the group, the road shanty course. You can see a lovely group of people, quite a decent size. Uh, there's actually more people than this, but on this particular show that we did at the Seagull Theatre to a sellout audience, they were singing their hearts out and uh, the audience thoroughly enjoyed it. We've been very lucky, myself, Stephen, and you can see in the back right-hand corner of your screen our lovely percussionist Andrew Marr, uh, also a low stuff boy. Um, we've been very lucky to have sell-out shows throughout every time, and it, it really has been a wonderful experience to us. Now, if you're interested in a little bit more about that, we are broadcasting uh, usually on a Tuesday night. Now, our last one of this year, we will be back with the Rogue Shanty Chorus Shanty Sessions. We'll be back on the 5th of January, but there's one more, which is tonight, sorry, tomorrow night. So if you'd like to join us then, please do join us 7.30 on this same Facebook page or YouTube page, however you're joining us. Join in tomorrow night for the same same time, same place, and you'll hear some shanties, and that will be in representation of the Rogue Shanty Chorus. But in any case, what we're here for tonight is local history, the Low Soft History Sessions with Ivan Bunn. So without any further ado, what I'm going to do is I'm going to welcome Ivan to talk about tonight's presentation and the, sh the slideshow, which is called Connections, the Man with the Pistols. And here is Ivan. Hi, Ivan. Hiya. Good evening, Paul. How are you? I'm very well, my man. Thank you yeah. very much for asking. Good evening, everybody who's joined us. Thanks for joining us again. It's a uh, my sort of spawn song tonight for a little <laughs> while. I've got a feeling I shall um, flat back again at some time in the future, not too distant future, um, I hope. Um, I just, again, um, just reiterate what Paul has been saying. Thanks, everybody who's uh, tuned in over these last uh, 23 sessions. Um, be it to all of them or some of them, uh, really do appreciate your support. Really hope that you've enjoyed them. I've done my best to try and make a varied content uh, over these um, literally months now. Um, I've enjoyed doing it. Um, I think that goes without saying. I've. It's been, as Paul kind of intimated as well, it's been kind of a help to me sitting here. Um, when I retired finally from the record office back in 
January, which feels like two lifetimes ago okay. now. Um, I had all sorts of plans of what where my life was going to go. And of course, come March with the pandemic and everything, um, I've been to put it, uh, um, uh, I was going to say crudely, you know, I won't put it crudely, um, but to be honest with you, I've been in, felt in some sort of a limbo world at a loose end. And this has helped very much me tie the loose ends together and continue doing um, what I love doing the most, which is um, giving talks and also my historical research. So uh, hopefully it's been a two-way traffic uh, over the um, past months um, that you've been able to find something of interest, something to take your mind off um, what's going on, the same as I've been able to do the same thing by spending um, quite a lot of time, and this is not a complaint, <laughs> uh, but it's a, an observation, um, putting the talks together as well. So that's kept me occupied, kept the old brain cells ticking over. And um, yeah, so once again, thanks everybody f for your support. Um, I'm not going to ramble on too much about that. Um, okay, tonight's talk is a little bit different. Um, it's history. And um, I've given it the title... Um, connections, the man with the pistols, because I didn't want to give anything away uh, about it. Just to say that this is as, um, this story is one that I've been researching for a long while. Um, hopefully, one day I'd like to um, write it up um, as a book. Um, <clears throat> people, these talks, episodes. Um, we'll use the last of which trial for an example um we kind of jump in there right at the beginning uh with the first accusations we follow the trial we follow everything that's happened we follow the lives of the people involved not to a point um and then we come to the conclusion and that's the end of it but of course for those people involved in the trial it wasn't the end of it their lives continued so on for many decades afterwards. Uh, they went their different ways. They had um, went in different directions. Um, some were successful, some were not. And um, there's a tendency to forget that. So my, my talk tonight is called Connections um, because I want to show how um, local history can connect with the much bigger picture. Um, hopefully... I've been successful. Um, it's one of the most difficult talks I've had to put, um, I put together in actual fact. Um, I'll explain why at the end. You probably will become obvious why when, um, as I go through the, um, the talk. Um, if you want to pin questions up, I can't see them, but Paul will relay a few of them um, at the end. Um, not much else to say, really. Um, if you're all sitting comfortably, as they used to say, um, then I'll begin. Okay, Ivan. Well, the, your talks have taken us all around Lowestoft, uh, from Gunton, Alton, Kirkley, uh, Kessingland and Pakefield, as well as uh, a, across the county as well, uh, from witches to witchfinder generals, um, battles and battery greens. And tonight is is taking us a little bit further, I think. So, as you hmm. said, without, without uh, anything else to talk about, um, other than the subject in hand, Let's do just that. I'm going to take some of these uh, overlays off. I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Ivan while I just fire up the while I fire up the slideshow to accompany Ivan's talk. I hope you all enjoy it very much. And here it is. Thank you. Right, so here we go then. Um, in at the deep end, as I say, connections. The man with the pistols, and these are the pistols. Um, that will feature in tonight's story, but the story's not going to start right at the beginning. Um, we're going to start um, a third of the way into the story, and we're going to not going to start locally for a change. We're actually going to start here in early 19th century uh, New York. Here you can see Manhattan um, Island. And um, to the north is the Hudson River, to the south at uh, the bottom end there is the East River. And the, the story starts here. Um, across the Hudson 
from the southern end of Manhattan Island um, across the New Jersey. Um, there is uh, one of these places have got Indian names. Apparently, there is a place called Weehawken, and it's there became a famous or infamous dueling ground. Um, that little red circle, the little star, I hope you can see it. That's a wee Hawken across the um, Hudson River. And that's the infamous dueling ground. In the um, 18th through into the early 19th century, dueling, um, sometimes seriously, sometimes just a, a matter of uh, a gentlemanly way of showing their disagreement, um, didn't always intend to kill each other, um, was quite common. And um, especially amongst the um, middle and upper classes, um, they would often settle a dispute um, by having a duel. And there is a very, very famous duel in American history. And we have to go back in time and we have to go back to the two um, participants if that's the right word in this duel so if, if um paul could just click me up onto the next slide please the two people we've got concerned here they might be familiar with your american history you might not these are two of the founding fathers of um the embryonic united states um, of america um, the gentleman on the left, he, um, our story uh, takes us to 1804, early 19th century. He is the Vice President of the United States of America, and he's a very, very strong politico. Um, the man on the right, Alexander Hamilton, whose name I'm sure many of you or some of you might be familiar with, he was the first Treasury Secretary of the early United States of America, um, a hero during the um, revolution, or as the Americans would call uh, um, uh, the War of Independence. And uh, both of these men played a big part in not only fighting the Brits um, and beating the Brits, they formed a very, very big and powerful role in setting up uh, the United States of America. And by the early 1800s, they, as you can tell from their um, um, occupations, if you like, they had basically reached the top of the tree. And these two gentlemen were diametrically opposed in their political views. And um, to such a way that... Um, Aaron Burr, the gentleman on the left there, the vice president, he was quite outspoken and um, he was heard to make disparaging remarks about Alexander Hamilton's um, political views. Hamilton was a great writer of um, political pamphlets, um, uh, quite an orator. And anyway, Hamilton got to hear about Buer's um, disparate, uh, dis, uh, disparaging, I can't say it, <laughs> uh, disparaging words and challenged him to a duel. And they caught the ferry across to Weehawken and there they fought their duel. And if we can go to the next um, slide, please. Here's a, so this is Weehawken, Weehawken, across from Manhattan Island. You can see in this early um, sketch engraving, you can see in the distance across the Hudson weather, uh, the um, early buildings of Manhattan Island. It's the 11th of July, 1804. Now Hamilton in actual fact was actually opposed to dueling, um, but he'd even written some papers uh, about it. And um, he, he um, apparently went with no intention of actually killing anybody. And um, he fired first and he fired high and the ball missed Aaron Burr. But Burr then leveled his pistol, 
and shot Hamilton in the chest and mortally wounded him. Hamilton was taken back across the um, Hudson, taken to his house in um, uh, downtown Manhattan Island, and uh, there um, the next day expired. And the whole incident caused, as you might uh, imagine, the um, Aaron Burr, the vice president, the second in command of the whole of the United States of America, actually killing um, one of his fellow compatriots and also a high-ranking um, member of the embryonic federal government. And this is a um, an after's impression um, of what happened. So we can go to the next slide. Here's a slightly later um, engraving. This shows the um, site of the dueling ground and uh, there you can see towards the bottom uh, left you can see fenced in a memorial that was soon erected to Hamilton. And um, I thought I heard music then, I must be imagining things. Uh, Hamilton, as I said, was very much revered. Um, he was a very, very popular man. Um, he wasn't totally, um, um, he was born in the Caribbean. He wasn't an American by birth. Um, and he was up to a point, although he fought against them, um, he was quite, um, a supporter is not the right word really. He was, um, he wasn't totally anti-British, shall we put it um, that way. He was a very logical um, thinking man, uh, a very clever man, a very clever politician. And um, there's no doubt that the um, early United States of America um, lost a very, very valuable and um, <clears throat> political man. He set up the first treasury. He set up the first, um, as we'll see later, uh, the first bank. And um, so his memory was revered right from the word go. Um, Buer seems to have gotten away um, with it. He died um, not many um, years after that, uh, but the incident has always been um, recorded. If you could just click for me, please. And here we see, this is the same, the same dueling ground today, um, at Weehawken, and um, it totally changed, obviously, from 1804. Um, but there you can see on the left in the background, you can see the skyline of Manhattan Island. And there is the modern, the modern um, memorial uh, in memory of Hamilton and people still come along there apparently and um, no, no. the incident caused a an outcry all over um, Europe and America and this is from the Aberdeen Press and Journal of 22nd of August 1804 um, reporting in America the fatal duel. Um, the article was much longer than that, but this is the, this is the article um, explaining um, what had happened. Both um, Buer and um, Hamilton had been officers in the Continental Army um, fighting the British, so they were ex-soldiers. And on the right, quite interestingly, and I suppose understanding is a printed copy that appeared in a newspaper of Alexander Hamilton's will. And he drew up this will two days before the duel. And um, the, as everybody who draws up the will has to, they have to name their executors. And he uh, named his three executors. Now, one of them, we see, I don't know if you can read that there, um, he says, first, I appoint J. B. Church, uh, Nicholas Fish and Nathaniel Pendleton, um, the city um, of the city um, esquires um, to be my executors. The man that we're interested in 
is a, or is or was a very very close friend of um, Hamilton, and we'll see why shortly. Um, he's he's John B. Church, or to give him his full title, his name is John Barker Church, and he plays a big part in our story, or our story actually revolves around him. And if we can change slides again, please. So if we go back to the um, engraving, um, which seems to have been quite accurate, you can see Hamilton there firing his pistol in the air and Burr about to shoot, um, he's just shot him. But there in the foreground is a small box of two dueling pistols. Now, those two dueling pistols, in actual fact, belong to Hamilton's um, good friend, probably one of his best friends, John Barker Church. And um, those are the actual pistols belonging to John Barker Church um, that were used um, in the duel. So who was John Barker Church? That's a good question. He wasn't an American patriot. He was an out and out uh, Brit. Um, and his arrival in uh, America um, was because uh, there's the man himself. This is John Barker Church. And he arrived in uh, America under, shall we say, uh, he ran away from his job he was born in um 18 uh, sorry 1748 and um he worked um in london um he worked for a, for, uh, a big company of grocers in london and the story is that he was put there um he he, he was financed uh by his uncle, John Barker. Now, John Barker was his mum's brother. And so he was in, um, in London working as a grocer. And um, apparently he was a, quite a profligate guy. Um, he, um, he was there in his um, early 20s. He's quite a profligate guy. He was also um, a gambler and a spendthrift. He'd also been involved um, in a duel. And in the London Gazette, the newspaper, the um, official government paper that publishes um, all important legal uh, notices, etc., uh, there is a letter published on the 5th of July, 1774, at the top left there, uh, whereby um, it says, uh, notice is hereby given that John Barker Church is no longer a partner in the corporation uh, uh, in the corporation ship carried on under the firm of Cyril Harding and Church of Mark Lane, London, Grocers, and that the business is carried on um, by Samuel Sewell and Francis Harding alone under the firm of Cyril Harding. Um, to whom only all persons indebted to the Sedley Corporation ship are to pay their debts. So they've now kicked out and sacked um, John Barker Church. And he's bankrupt. He's got no money. Um, there's also rumours, it's also rumoured um, that he had been involved in a couple of duels, which were um, actually illegal as well. And on the 6th of August, 1774, only a month after they, he's, uh, the company he worked for kicked him out, um, he is declared to be bankrupt. And a commission of bankruptcy was awarded um, um, so that they could get whatever assets he had to pay off his creditors, um, be they great or small. And um, so that's 6th of August, 1774. He was to appear before the commissioners and his debtors. And, to, and of course, to be a bankrupt in those days was actually um, a crime. And so what did he do? 
under the pseudonym of John Carter, he fled to America, to the colonies as they were then. Uh, America doesn't exist, there's the, um, the United States of America. He fled to the colonies um, shortly after um, August 1774, possibly before, we have no details. Don't know how he got there, how he managed to get a passage, but he went there and he went under the alias of John Carter. Now, John Barker Church, we'll stick to his um, correct name, seems to have been quite a resourceful guy. So if we move on to the next slide, we can see that he soon made a name for himself in um, the colonies. Yeah, can we change the slide, please? Slide, please. The London Gazette, the 15th of June, 1776, um, said that the commissioner bankrupt awarded and issued against John Bayard the church, late of Mark um, Lane, London Grocer, intend to meet on the 16th day of July next, that's 1776, at five o'clock in the afternoon at the Guildhorn in order to make a final dividend of the bankrupts the state effect uh, and uh, etc 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 however he should have appeared there but he didn't and he couldn't because in by the middle of 1776 posing as john carter john barker church is now truly ensconced in america and in July that same year, he's actually here at the Second Continental Congress uh, where the Declaration of Independence is made. And he didn't sign the Declaration of Independence, but somehow he seems to have been a very clever, wily sort of guy, um, still under the alias of John Carter. He was one of the three commissioners appointed by the Continental Con uh, Congress um, on the 26th of July, that's um, three weeks after the Declaration of Inde um, in, uh, Independence, to audit the accounts of the army in the Northern Department, um, uh, the um, area of New Zealand was divided up militarily into um, various departments, areas, and he was um, appointed as one of the three commissioners in the northern department so how he managed to get there so soon um it's what two years since um he was declared bankrupt he still is declared uh, bankrupt in um, back in england but he's not only managed to get into um philadelphia um, um he's managed to somehow get a good paid job um, working for the Continental Congress, the um, embryonic federal government, in, to all accounts. So there was no way he was going to pop up in London to answer his creditors now, um, although they had ordered him to do so back in um, Britain. So if we go to the next slide, please. Now, he would have been familiar with this house. Uh, the commander of the um, Northern um, District, the Continental Army, um, was Major General Philip Schuyler of Dutch descent. And um, he was one of George Washington's um, right hand men. And he was the commander of the Northern Department of the Continental Army. And as um, John Carter, as he was still calling himself, was auditing the accounts. He would have had direct contact um, with this man. And um, again, we can only speculate based on um, later um, uh, based on later um, incidents that happened. Um, that he was familiar with the house. Um, he must have been there and he became familiar uh, with this attractive 21-year-old daughter at that time um, of the general, his oldest daughter, um, Angelica Schuyler. 
Uh, she was 21, uh, uh, very attractive, um, socialite, um, people writing about her at the time. Um, later biographers of the show as I said uh, that she was a prominent member of the social elite everywhere she lived. The general was a very high fluting, high ranking, um, not only general and soldier, but socialite, as were the Schuyler, um family. Um, he was wealthy, um, as you can see by his big house, and John Carter obviously met Angelica Schuyler, and um, they fell in love and wanted to get married. But the general wouldn't have much to do with this upstart Englishman who seems to have arrived from nowhere and was courting his daughter. But this, again, I think this is an example of, of, of um, John Barker Churches, a.k.a. John um, Carter's um, influence over people and events um, that he married her without the parents' consent. And if we flip over to the next screen, please. And in 1777, John Carter, still as John Carter, and Angel Angelica eloped to her mother's ancestral home in a place that I can't pronounce because it's Dutch. It's Reselewijk in Albany, um, upstate New York. Uh, the Reselewijks were the... Um, um, the matriarchs of um, and Joyla. So her grandmother's uh, maiden name was Rensselaer, and they've got their own little township there. And she ran away to her grandmother's um, town, and she married uh, or John and uh, Angelica were married on the twenty third of July, seventeen seventy seven. And it's reported that General Joyla, being ignorant of Church's family, his connection and situation in life found the match extremely disagreeable. You can almost imagine the ire of Angelica's um, father when he finds that um, they've eloped. But um, through the uh, uh, um, aid of her grandmother um, and uh, her father's mother-in-law, she was able to uh, apparently reassure the general that... Um, um, John Carter, a.k.a. Uh, John Barker Church, was in fact um, uh, a suitable um, husband for his eldest daughter. And Barker, assuming his correct name from now on, um, he's no longer John Church, but um, uh, he's no longer... Um, Uh, calling himself by his alias, but um, he's now doing his, uh, he's now John Barker Church to everybody, and um, he's accepted into the family. Um, some months before this, if we can just um, flick, um, not long after he got married, um, he moved uh, to Boston. Him and his um, new bride um, moved to Boston. He resigned his post um, in the Continental Army as an auditor, and um, he went into part a business partnership um, with this gentleman, Colonel Jeremiah um, Wadsworth. Um, this is in early in 1777, um, during the time of the... Um, uh, American War of Independence. Wadsworth um, was like um, John Barker Church, um, a very, very good businessman. And between them, they worked up a partnership and um, working in property, banking, um, buying and selling commodities. And uh, they made a lot of money over the next few years between them and their partnership. And um, again, Jeremiah Wadsworth um, 
is another one of the sort of heroes, if you like, of the American uh, Revolution. And uh, John Barker Church is um, hooked his wagon onto um, Wadsworth. And um, if we can move on to the next slide. This is where ha the friendship with Alexander Hamilton um, comes in. Angelica Schuyler um, had a sister, a younger sister, Elizabeth Schuyler, aged 23, and Alexander Hamilton, aged 24. There he is um, in his um, uh, Major General's uniform. He was a great war hero before he became a lawyer and businessman after the end of the um, Revolutionary War. And on the 14th of December, 1780, Elizabeth Schuyler and Alexander Hamilton uh, were married. And Elizabeth, of course, is Angelica's um, sister. Um, they were very close sisters. Hamilton and John Barker Church got on extremely well together and they became great friends. And um, that explains why um, uh, 24 years later, still as great friends, business partners as well after the war, that um, John Barker Church um, loaned his dueling pistols. Those dueling pistols um, I'll talk a little bit more about later, uh, but Church almost certainly took them to America with him because they are purpose made um, in London um, dueling pistols. So he took them with him, which does kind of mitigate or does indicate um, that he was prepared to use them, possibly that he had used them in um, London. Uh, um, we don't know. I haven't been able to find any details um, of any duels or the reports of any duels fought in London by John Barker Church, um, but certainly he had this pair of dueling pistols. The important thing to remember is that Alexander Hamilton, Elizabeth Schuyler, John Barker Church and um, Angelica Schuyler became incredibly close um, friends. Um, they moved to New York, um, they lived on Broadway, um, Alexander Hamilton, who was um, extremely well wealthy, um, had a large um, house built on, um, uh, it was a rural area then, Harlem, on Harlem Heights, and the families used to uh, meet up there um, regularly, socialising, um, and um, basically having a good life as the embryonic United States uh, began to form. So if we, um, an indication of how close they were, if we go to the next um, slide, some there were, it was intimated at times that um, their relationship was more than just uh, friendliness. There's um, Elizabeth and Alexander Hamilton. They both had big families and so these are the Hamilton children, Philip, and the next one is named An um, Angelica. Um, there's James Alexander. There's one called John Church Hamilton. And um, Angelica and John Barker Church also had a large family. Philip again, Philip Schuyler, the first child. Uh, Philip obviously named for his grandfather, Schuyler Philip as um, were Elizabeth and Alexandra's. Um, we've got Catherine Church, John Barker Church II, Elizabeth Matilda um, Church, presumably named for um, Elizabeth Hamilton. And we've got Richard Hamilton um, Church. We've got an Alexander Church and uh, Richard Stephen Church and um, finally an Angelica church were born. So these are their two families. And the I think the names of the, um, the children of both um, couples reflect their um, 
intimacy, if you want, in a way, their friendship in that they're borrowing names from each of the different families to name their children. And it has been suggested, uh, more than suggested, intimated from the many letters of um, um, Angelica Church um, to Alexander Hamilton that she wrote, uh, that they in actual fact were more than just friends, um, but they were actually um, having a quiet affair as well. Um, at one point, um, she wrote to her sister, and there's a tiny extract I've put at the bottom there, uh, about Alexander Hamilton, her sister's husband. She wrote, I love him very much, and if you were as generous as the old Romans, you would lend him to me for a little while. Um, I think that speaks uh, really. Haven't got time, obviously, to explain the, explain the love life of the Hamiltons and the churches, but um, it, it's just trying to illustrate how close these two families had become. And um, so we need to move on to follow John Barker Church through the... Um, eventually, John Barker Church and his part, business partner, Colonel Jeremiah Wadsworth of Hartford in Connecticut, secured a contract for provisioning the French forces in America as they were part of the Continental Army. And he became the Commissary General. Um, and two years um, after that, he um, and Wadsworth... Um, they were contractors as sole suppliers to the American army as well. Church prospered and the Washington, George Washington's former secretary noted um, in 1782 uh, that he, Church, had riches enough with common management to make the longest life very comfortable. So he's right at the top of the tree now as commissary general um, of the whole Continental Army. He is buying um, up the provisions for the um, Revolutionary Army, the Continental Army, and he's selling them on um, uh, to the Continental Congress. Uh, well, he, he's passing them on to the um, forces in the field uh, through the different commissary departments, and um, then he's submitting his bills, obviously making a profit, um, <clears throat> to the uh, <clears throat> to George Washington, the commander of the Continental Army. And it's pretty certain um, um, that he would, um, as Ham Hamilt um, Alexander Hamilton was George Wa one of George Washington's best and right hand uh, men and generals, um, there can be no doubt that uh, John Barker Church had direct contact at times with um, not only General George Washington, the commander of the Continental Army, <coughs> but this guy here, um, um, uh, Mar uh, Marquis de Lafayette, or usually known as just Lafayette, who was in actual fact um, one of the commanders of the French army that was assisting the rebel army um, in fighting the British. And so um, he's now moving, or has moved big time, right up not only the military um, tree, but also the social scale, the social ladder. So, as I said, well, we've got six six years since he was declared bankrupt in um uh no sorry some uh, six, eight years since he was declared bankrupt in um 1774 eight years on he's got one of the biggest and uh, most important jobs helping the um rebels the um in the american war of independence this must say a tremendous amount about the man himself and his abilities. So we must push on, got lots of ground to cover. On the 17th of October, 1781, Arthur's defeat at Yorktown, um, 
Lord Cornwallis, the British um, general in charge, surrendered to George Washington. Apparently, Alexander Hamilton played a very important role in the battle at Yorktown, which led to Long Lord Cornwallis being beaten. And um, it was there that Cornwallis surrendered his army, the British army, to George Washington. Uh, March 1782, March the following year, the British government passed a resolution calling for the nation to end the war. And September of the following year, um, the war came to an end, um, September the 3rd, um, significant date, many uh, uh, generations later. September the 1783, the war came to a formal end with the signing of the Treaty of Paris um, in Paris. Um, that's where Britain formally surrendered um, to the new United States of America and recognized them as a separate nation and country. And it's in 1782, if we flip on to the next slide, please. Uh, the summer of 1783, um, John Barker Church is with Wadsworth in Paris to settle his accounts with the French government. He's been supplying the French contingent of the Continental Army and um, one of his um, good friends were Lieutenant General Le Count de Rochambeau, uh, who we see there, and um, he... They were paid Wadsworth by the French £34,365 that were due to them. Um, from then onwards, for the next couple of years, he was flitting backwards and forwards between um, London and Paris. And um, the London Gazette noted on the 8th of November 1783 that the um, commissioner bankrupt against him from August 1774 had been superseded. That means he'd made an honest man at last and he'd actually gone and paid off all his creditors um, who um, had lost out when he became bankrupt um, those years earlier. So he was also a sort of an honest man as well. Um, writing to Hamilton um, from... Um, um, Writing to Hamilton um, in April 1786, he says, Mrs. Church is well. In about two months, she will give me another boy or girls. Jack, that's one of his boys, is grant a fine boy. He's now a pleasant villa, which I have purchased on the banks of the Thames, where we shall soon repair to pass the summer. So he's now decided to settle back in England. Um, this is the place that he purchased, Down Place in Windsor. It's still, this is a modern photograph of it. Apparently, it's unchanged um, uh, externally uh, since he purchased it. And um, as an aside, if you like trivia, um, in 1950, it became the studios of um, the people who made the Hammer horror films. And it's still a uh, film studio's... Um, uh, film company working out of that place today. But back in the day, this became um, John Barker Church's home with his family, and um, this is where he settled. So he's really, really hit the big time now back in England, socially, financially, and, and he's meeting with the big timers as well. If we go to the next uh, slide, please. Um, this is Carlton House in Pall Mall at that time. Um, this is at the home of George Augustus Frederick, the Prince of Wales. And John Barker Church becomes a very, very good um, friend of the Prince of Wales, later the Prince Regent, later George IV. He moves in the same circles. He spends lots of time um, at the Carlton House. Uh, with all the um, very wealthy cronies, including the Prince of Wales, uh, gambling um, and generally having a good life. Um, 
in October 1787, um, Angelica wrote to uh, sent a letter to Hamilton, one of the many, many that she wrote, um, telling Hamilton that his, uh, her husband's, John Barker Church, head is full of politics, adding that once in the British House of Commons, uh, where I should be happy to see him if he is possessed of your eloquence. So again, she's been flattering to Hamilton. And so now he's decided he needs to get into politics. Um, being the clever man he is, he finds a way to get in almost literally by the back door. And to do this, if we go to the next slide, he's encouraged by John Sawbridge, who's a, a radical of the uh, very radical member of the Whig party um, to join the Whigs and join the radicals. And, um, but he needs to get um, a seat in parliament. Um, so what he does, he buys this property. Um, John Barker Church buys another big house, Clayden House in the borough of Wendover. And he purchased it from um, Ralph II Earl Verney in 1788 for £6,000. Now, the reason he almost certainly bought it was because it was won before all the parliamentary reform. Wendover was one of the rotten boroughs. And um, by living at Wendover, <coughs> living in this particular house, Clayden House, um, that entitled him and one other person living in at Wendover to have seats in the Houses of Parliament. And there we see in 7th of August, 1790, John Barker Church Esquire and the Honourable Hugh Seymour uh, Conway, who was actually a, um, a captain in the Royal Navy, um, they become sitting members in the House of Colum, um, Commons. Again, all the time I was doing this research, I just couldn't help but keep um, totally amazed at how this guy seemed to be able to get whatever he wanted when he wanted it. Um, I guess it's a case of who you know, what you know, or not what you know, who you know, and how much money you've got. So he's joined the elite. So if we can push on, because I'm going to have to um, get to the end of the story. Um, he became very close friends with this very, very radical Whig MP, the Honourable Charles James Fox um, MP. Um, in fact, um, when Fox died, he was in debt to £9,000 that he'd borrowed from John Barker Church. Um, he also became a, a member of the Society of Friends of the People who looked up to... Um, Sir Thomas, uh, not Sir Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine, um, who wrote The Rights of um, Man, who was um, really uh, a promoter of the rights of the ordinary people. And Church became the same. Um, he was um, against the uh, war um, when Britain uh, voted to go to war um, in the late 1700s with France. He voted against it. He was a bit of a Francophile. Um, during the French Revolution, when many of the wealthy refugees fled from France to England, he looked, took them out under his wing and um, um, lodged them at his big houses and um, looked after them. He was no doubt, um, or saw himself a man of the people. He was very much up for parliamentary reform and um, he wanted to give... Remember, at that time, the ordinary men didn't have the franchise, couldn't vote. He wanted men to have the vote as well, uh, ordinary men to have um, the vote. So he was a very active member um, of Parliament. So once again, um, as his um, wife, as Angelica, had written to Hamilton, he was very desirous of becoming a member of Parliament. He finishes up um, as a member of Parliament. So we'll push on again, please. Again, he doesn't seem to be a man who could settle. 
by 1796, um, he seems to have had enough of um, being a member of parliament uh, because he resigned. And the following year, um, in March 1797, according to the New York Minerva and Mercantile Evening Advertiser of the uh, of, um, 27th of March, um, he returned to New York, landed there in March. Um, he traveled, as the um, newspaper reported, in the Fair American, that's the name of the ship, Captain Duplex, from London came passenger John B. Church Esquire, late member of the English Parliament, and his lady and family. Mr. Church has taken His Excellency the Governor's private mansion house on Broadway, and we understand he intends making this city his permanent place of residence. So not only has he man uh, gone back to America, he's got one of the, uh, to New York, he's got one of the best mansions, um, the late Governor's mansion um, at 51 uh, Broadway. And this is a little map of um, um, southern Manhattan, lower Manhattan, um, and his house was, um, I just realised I haven't put an indication where his house was, um, I can't point to it for you, <coughs> but um, his house um, on Broadway was not far from Wall Street in actual fact, um, he's in what would become the financial district, because now he's dabbling in um, all sorts of um, financial plans, so he's um, not only made his way all the way up the social scale, um, social tree in New York, um, and then gone back to England and done the same there. And then basically uh, he's at the top of the tree um, in New York when he returns. So he becomes, so this explains how he came to be there. Um his eldest son, Philip Schuyler Church, um, here's a painting done by the famous American artist John Trumbull. Um, this is Angelica with baby Philip Schuyler Church and one of their servants. And um, Philip Schuyler um, um, trained to be a judge. He became Judge um, Philip Schuyler. Um, had a bit of trouble finding... Uh, a picture of the man, but again, John Barker Church decided obviously that his son was going to benefit from his wealth. And here's Philip um, Schuyler Church, and um, this man here, this is Robert Morris Jr. He was, in actual fact, another one of the revolutionary generals who fought through the war. And at the bottom there, um, you can see um, his signature of the Declaration of Independence. He had borrowed a tremendous amount of money from John Barker Church some years earlier, and um, he um, mortgaged 100,000 acres of land um, in um, upstate um, New York. He would mortgaged um, that land to John Barker Church. When Church returned to America, um, he wanted his the money back, and Robert Morris wasn't able to pay him back. So John Barker Church foreclosed on the mortgage and became the um, owner of a hundred thousand acres of land in upstate New York in uh, Genesee County, and. Um, what he did was he made all of that land um, over to Philip Schuyler Church. And Philip Schuyler Church uh, developed it, sold off plots, etc., etc., and he founded a township. And if we can go on to the next slide, please. So um, here's, um, thanks, Google Maps. Um, here is... Um, uh, a map of um, uh, Northern Pennsylvania and um, New York State. Um, Manhattan Island and New York City is always down the bottom right hand corner. And the, the um, little marker marks the site um, of the 100,000 acres that um, 
John Parker um, got from Boris and he made the whole lot over to his son Philip Church and Philip in turn um, created a new township um, close to the border with Pennsylvania and um, in uh, uh, Genesee County as it was called and he created this township and he named it Angelica and it still exists today uh, here's another aerial view of it and it is part if you like of the um, American history trail people who are following the um, fortunes of America after the end of the um, War of Independence um, uh, this is part of the trial that you go to. There's one of the signs telling you about the town of Angelica and Philip Shaw, the church, <coughs> the son, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, the son of Angelica and um, John Barker Church um, named this township for his uh, mother. Uh, some few years later, um, John Barker Church um, decided to build himself his own villa, Philip, um, um, his son's um, prime residence, the Villa Belvedere. I haven't spelt, misspelt Belvedere on there. That's how it's actually spelt at the time. And this is the Villa Belvedere today. It's still uh, standing. So he's made the big time. So we're pushing on again, please. In partnership um, with Hamilton in particular, um, they founded two um, banks, uh, the Bank of Manhattan Company and the Bank of North America. And there's the advert for the bank. And he became um, a founder alongside uh, John Barker Church. Uh, sorry, a founder with beside Alexander Hamilton and uh, the main directors of both of these um, banks. And true to, uh, no, um, at Hoboken in New Jersey in 1799, um, he was, um, he claimed to have been um, insulted by Aaron Burr and uh, they actually fought a duel on the 2nd of September, 1719 in um, New Jersey. Um, nobody was injured. It was just um, the kind of a gentleman's firing the guns each other and not um, intending to hit each other. And so on the 2nd of September 1799, he actually used his pistols personally in a duel with a beer. Seems as if everybody was falling out with beer. Um, or it's possibly that Aaron Beer wasn't a very nice person. Again, each of these characters... Um, could have books written about them and they have had books written about them apart from John Barker Church. So we need to push on again, uh, conscious of the passing of time. Um, another duel was fought and we don't know whether it was used in John Barker Church's pistols. Uh, we hawk in New Jersey on the 24th of November 1801 and the combatants in this one um, were this gentleman, Philip Hamilton, um, he was just um, uh, 19 years old. Uh, that's um, Alexander Hamilton's eldest son. And another man who I haven't been able to find out uh, much at all, uh, This, except he was a lawyer, uh, George I. Eker. And um, Eker was a fair bit older than Hamilton. He had said... Uh, uh, Philip Hamilton, he had, he had apparently muttered or said disparaging things about um, Philip Hamilton's father, Alexander Hamilton, and so he challenged Eker to a duel and Philip Hamilton was killed in that duel three years before his father would go the same way um, under the pistol of um Aaron Burr. Again, I'm not certain, but it would seem possibly um, that the pistols that we used uh, were John Barker Churches because um, Philip's Hamil uh, Philip Hamilton's 
uh, second um, was in fact John Barker Church. So he was there when the son was killed. And so we push on again. And of course, that brings us almost full circle to where we started. We hawk in New Jersey, 11th of July, um, 1804. Um, just a short while after the son was killed, Hamilton was killed as well. And as we've seen, the pistols that we used there, again, were John Barker Churches, uh, the man with the pistols, obviously. The loss of her husband and um, her, her son and then her husband apparently was um, almost destroyed um, Alexandra Hamilton's um, wife Elizabeth, Elizabeth Schuyler. Um, she never recovered from the loss of the two important men um, in her life. Alexander Hamilton was buried in the cemetery um, at Trim, Trin, uh, can't say it, Trinity Church, um, only a short stone throw away from where both Hamilton and um, John Barker Church lived. And in fact, the, the funeral cortege um, left from John Barker Church's house um, on Broadway, from what I can understand, and took him the short distance to um, the Trinity Cemetery um, where he was buried um, alongside or close to um, his son. So if we can move to the next slide, please. And this is um, Alexander Hamilton's um, tomb, grave, monument in the churchyard um, at the cemetery. Um, Trinity Cemetery. Um, it's not the it's not the burial ground of the Ch Trinity Church because the original Trinity Church that um, stood there when Hamilton was buried um, has been replaced uh, twice since then. But this is the um, tomb, the grave of Alexander Hamilton, and we'll push on to the next slide if we could please. From then onwards, the churches seem to have been in decline. We find very little about them. Age 58, Angelica Church died on the 13th of March um, in 1814 in New York City. And she was also buried in Trinity Church Cemetery at Broadway. Um, but her grave is not known. Um, it's supposed that she's buried under there's a tomb under this slab. It's the um, close friend and business associate of John Barker Church. Uh, um, the living, uh, his name is Livingstone, um, and his family were close to John Barker Churches. And it seems the um, Angelica Church was actually buried in the tomb here. And um, there is a sign that you can see here on the right-hand picture. I can't read it, telling um, this, that this is supposedly the um, burial spot of Angelica Church. Shortly after that, uh, if we can just move on again, please. John Barker Church returned to England. And for four years, he lived quietly. Um, he had none of the, um, he seems to have lost favour socially, um, what have you. And he seems to have, um, blown most of his money as well. He lived quietly in a house at Duke Street in Piccadilly, and he died there on the 27th of April, 1818, um, age 70. And he was buried in the churchyard here at St. James's Piccadilly on the 2nd of May. Uh, there's, I could find no reports of his uh, death, no obituary in any contemporary newspapers. Um, he did not leave a will, and um, the letters of administration valued his estate at £1,500. And so I suppose um, you could say his obituary should be how mighty are the fallen. So, so 
we've traced John Barker Church's life most of the way, but now we need to see where and who, uh, where he came from and who he was. So if we go on to the next slide, he was in fact born in Lowestoft. He was born in Lowestoft on the 30th October 17. Uh, 48 and here you can see from the parish register um, where the arrow there is pointing um, that's the John Barker son of Richard and Elizabeth Church 16 um, sorry I put 16 on that should be 1748 <gasps> ah that's 1748 not 1648 I'm entitled to make one mistake November the 9th he was um, baptized John Barker Church um, so where did he originate? Who were his forebears? Who is this man? So if we click to the next slide, I am hope this is going to work um, after we... Um, no. And so that's where his family uh, came from, from Lowestoft. That's where his um, parents, um, Richard Church and Elizabeth Barker, hence the John Barker Church, um, name um, came from and that's where he's baptized so if we can move on to my next slide I've tried an experiment here I don't know if this is going to work these are the connections so there's John Barker Church his father Richard Church his mother Elizabeth Barker and he only had two surviving siblings Matilda Church and Elizabeth Church his father his grandfather was Samuel Church his grandmother was Elizabeth Pike his great-grandfather again was Richard Church and he had married Susan Pacey Elizabeth Pake, his grandmother, was the daughter of Joseph Pake and Deborah Pacey. Deborah Pacey and Susan Pacey were sisters. They had another sister, Elizabeth Pacey. And of course, the three girls' father was Samuel Pacey. So Elizabeth Pacey and Deborah Pacey Deborah Pacey being his um, great great um, grandmother was in actual fact one of the girls who featured in the trial of the last of witches was instigated by Samuel Pacey. So on his father's side John Barker Church was descended from Samuel Pacey. And uh, so these connections, um, really, when I started on this family tree, um, as I said, um, it may. So we've got Father Richard Church, Grandfather Rich, um, uh, Samuel Church, Great Grandfather um, Richard Church again. And his great great grandfather um, was Samuel Pacey through that lineage. And of course, um, Susan wasn't um, one of the girls who was bewitched, but Deborah Pacey and Elizabeth Pacey um, were. So there is a direct link there to John Barker Church. And I did wonder whether he knew any of this. Um, I don't know. And I don't suppose we ever will, but those are the, the those are the connections. But there are other connections uh, that I've established that the there's not much autobiographical been written about John Barker Church. Uh, most of it um, comes from one book that I'll show you in a moment, um, uh, an American um, publication, um, which is a little bit um, off the beaten track, and it doesn't really 
look into his English background. That's what I've been endeavouring to do. And it mentions the fact that a wealthy uncle placed him in to um, the, the job he had in London when he went um, bankrupt and no more than that. Um, his father, Richard Church, disappears, literally. I have not been able to find... I've got all of the details of these people when they were born and <clears throat> when they died, apart from his father. Um, I know that his father was born in 1711 in Lowestoft, and he married on the 29th of July in Lowestoft, Elizabeth Barker. Uh, she was born in Lowestoft in 1710. And... But... There is no record, and his mother died in the year 1800. John Barker Church's mother, Elizabeth, died in um, 1800. There is no record anywhere, and I've scoured them for uh, m months, for years now. I cannot find his father's death. I think his father probably died when um, um, he had other siblings, all of whom died uh, um, as infants. The only ones that uh, would reach maturity are Matilda, Elizabeth and John Barker himself. And um, I think that um, his benefactor, in fact, I'm sure his benefactor, certainly in London, the wealthy uncle was, in fact, um, this man. If we can click on to the next uh, screen now for me, please. This is um, John Barker. John Barker was an incredibly, um, uh, he was actually, um, a, a Lowestoft um, born man. And he was very wealthy. He became governor of London's principal marine insurance company, the London Assurance, chairman of the Ramsgate Harbour Trustees Works Committee, one of the elder brethren of Trinity House, a director of Greenwich Hospital, governor of the London Hospital, vice president of the Magdalen Charity. And I haven't researched the Magdalen Charity, not quite sure what that is. Um, and he's described in his obituary um, after he died um, on the 1st of November, 1787. He's described as a gentleman of the most extensive benevolence of mankind in general, and particularly of the distressed seamen and widows of Lowestoft, of which uh, place he was a native and where his loss will be severely felt. His remains were interred in a most respectful manner in the family vault at Lowestoft, attended by a great number of the inhabitants. It is said that he has bequeathed something considerable to be appropriated to charitable uses to the place of his nativity. And we know from his will um, that he did. Now, if we just go back, and I'm wondering, uh, this is a bit of speculation um, on my part, if I just flip my papers over here i'm wondering if in actual fact john barker church came back to last off for the funeral of his benevolent um uncle uh, i think he the uncle took um young john barker church his sister elizabeth and his sister Matilda under his wing after John Barker, um, the uncle, sister, John Barker Church's uh, mother, Elizabeth, um, died. And was, she was left a widow and um, with three young children. And he took them under his wing. As we say here, he was, um, he does never seem to have married. Uh, sorry, did he marry twice? Um, but he was an extremely benevolent man. And I can't help wondering uh, when he was buried at Lowestoft. Um, I can't help wondering if perhaps um, John Barker Church was living in London. He'd moved to London a year earlier. And I can't help wondering if possibly 
uh, John Barker Church, um, possibly with his family, came up to up to Lowestoft for their benevolent uncle's um, funeral. Um, but I I get the feeling that they did, and um, I'll tell you for why. I know there was contact um, between them. If we flip to the next screen, please. There's a little bit of incongruity um, here because, um, oh, sorry, uh, can, we, can you just take that back um, one slide for me, please? Um, it's, yeah, there we go. Um, the reason I think perhaps he did, because I have a copy um, of his will, um, John Barker's will. He lived um, at Mansell Street in Goodmansfield, Middlesex. And in his um, will, he left to his sister, that's John Barker, Elizabeth, John Barker Church's mother, the sum of £2,000. To John Barker Church, um, his nephew and two um, nieces, uh, John Barker Church's um, sisters, Elizabeth and Matilda, um, he left them £400 in annuities to be divided amongst them. And to John Barker Church himself, he left 10,003% um, consolidated bank annuities and also £1,000 of bank stock together with his gold watch and a gold-headed cane. Uh, to Angelica, John Barker Church's wife, he left five hundred pounds, and each and to each and every of the four children now living, fifth, an extra fifty pounds apiece for mourning. Now that's to buy mourning uh, clothes. So that's mourning as in M O U R N I N G, and it makes me wonder if what that's not because they um, he did it because they were actually coming to attend his funeral. Um, he added a codicil on the 15th of March, 1787. Um, I give and bequeath unto the five children of my nephew, John Barker Church, the sum of 5,000 pound percent annuities to be equally divided amongst them, share and share alike, on attaining the age of 21, or in the case of the daughters on marriage, uh, before they attain that age. And that his will was proved in London only a few days um, after his death. So there's indications there to me that definitely there was contact between um, the benevolent uncle John Barker and his um, nephew uh, John Barker Church. Sorry, if we could push on to the next one now. There's an anomaly creeps in though, and um, here, I don't know if you can read that, uh, this is the calendar of Freeman of Great Yarmouth. And we see here that um, uh, uh, John Barker C., John Barker Church, Esquire, son of Richard Church, was made a Freeman of Great Yarmouth. Um, and that's odd because the B afterwards means because he was born there. And yet he's certainly christened baptized in um Lois, uh, in st margaret's church however it's no doubt that his sister john barker church's sister miss matilda church um and the evidence is as well his mother elizabeth church um resided in this house um, on King Street, Great Yarmouth, on the corner uh, with row 115. Uh, it's a pub now, I think, but that's the original house. And we do know that um, they were living there at the time of their death. And so, and it does beg the question as well, A, why did John Barker Church um, uh, was granted to, uh, freemanship of Great Yarmouth um, um, uh, why he applied for it and why did he tell the um, um, the, uh, uh, the burghers of Great Yarmouth, the burgesses of Great Yarmouth, that he was born there? Possibly he was born there, uh, possibly because his family came from 
um, Lowestoft. His ancestors all came from Lowestoft. He um, was taken back there as a small baby to um, be baptised, but his father, Richard, was living uh, uh, and his family were living in Great Yarmouth. But all of his siblings, um, even those that died young, were all baptised in Lowestoft St Margaret's Church. So uh, it, there is an anomaly, but we do have this link that there is this, his sister and his mum um, for most of the um, 18th century and into the early 19th century, we were living in this house in Great Yarmouth. And we do have um, evidence, if we can go on again to the next slide. From Elizabeth, um, here's a copy of the first page of his mother's will. Uh, it was dated the 11th of October, 1799, and was proved um, at London in the Progressive Court of um, Canterbury um, in, um, um, on the 19th of March, 1800. And she was interred on the 1st of February, Elizabeth Church from Yarmouth, age 91, that's his mum, and she's actually buried in St Margaret's Church, in St Margaret's Churchyard. Um, unfortunately, um, because I can't get to the record office to check um, the um, index of graves, um, I haven't been able to locate the graves, but I'm sure at some point, <laughs> if I'm able, um, I'll be able to locate uh, where their graves were. But again, she lives quite a comprehensive will. And because um, she was left, his mum was left um, a lot of money and annuities from um, her brother, um, John Barker. Um, John Barker Church's um, uncle that we're talking about. Um, but in her will, um, as I say, May the 11th of October 1799, at which time John Barker Church and his family are back in New York. Um, she says, I give to my son John Barker Church Esquire the sum of £1,000 and to my daughter-in-law Angelica Church, his wife, the sum of £300. I also give to my six grandchildren, Philip Church, Catherine Church, John Barker Church, Jr., um, Elizabeth Church, Alexander Church and Richard Church, um, £50 apiece. Um, and after the death of Matilda, my daughter, I give my pictures to my son, John Barker Church, to and for his own use and disposal. She also gave him 500 shares in the capital stock, the London Assurance, um, to her daughter, Matilda, to assign the same after the death um, of um, the said Matilda to such of the five children of my son John Barker Church to be equally divided among them and on their attaining the age of 21 years respectively. So she hasn't forgotten her son whatsoever, John um, Barker Church, and she's um, provided for him quite copiously um, in her will. And so one would presume that... Um, even though she's in Great Yarmouth and he's living um, in New York City, Manhattan, uh, that there is um, contact between them, uh, that they are writing to each other. Unfortunately, as far as I know, none of um, John Barker Church's uh, papers um, seem to exist. So there's um, his mum um, keeping in touch with him and certainly leaving him something in her will. There's his wealthy uncle, um, not only providing for him um, as a young man with a, a job in London uh, before he went bankrupt, he's also um, um, providing um, substantial bequests in his will to John Barker Church. And also, as I said, most interestingly, the fact that he's allowed £50 to each of the um, children of John Barker Church uh, for mourning clothes um, and that normally indicates to me that um, that's because they have to dress up for mourning for his funeral so there seems to be some indication um, that in, um, 
1787 that um, John Barker Church might well have come back to Lowestoft and who knows, possibly went up to Great Yarmouth to see um, his um, sister and um, Matilda. There was one other um, sister, um, I haven't followed that line, she married um, a lawyer by the name of Panther, uh, she was Elizabeth Panther and she gets a mention in the wills as well. So that's Matilda, uh, sorry that's not Matilda, that's his mum's will and if we push on So here's the will of, uh, these all come from the National Archives, so my, the reference numbers are there. Um, Matilda Church was never married. She was quite a benevolent but eccentric um, old lady living in Great Yarmouth. And um, the Norfolk Chronicle did know um, on Saturday the 16th of February 1805, yesterday died in the 73rd year of her age, Mrs, and she wasn't a Mrs, well it says Mrs Matilda Church, a maiden lady um, of handsome fortune. Her loss is severely felt by many of the poor who were weakly relieved by her bounty. So she was pretty um, wealthy as well. But once again, um, plowing through her will, um, she's very, very beneficial to John Barker Church, her brother and his family. Um, she, uh, she, her will is an odd one if you're into wills. Um, she, in actual fact, um, made her will. Then she added a short codicil, an extra bit. But then she sat down uh, in the ensuing months and years um, writing her memorandum of what she wanted um, done um, with her body and her um, effects, um, which wasn't really part of the will, but it was eventually accepted as part of the will. After her death, her personal representatives went to the prerogative court and uh, produced a document and the, it was accepted. But um, she, um, the will was dated the 10th of December, 1802. And she wanted to be buried in linen in the chancel of Lowestoft Church in the same grave uh, with my grandfather church to be carried there by six men who are to have a guinea each and to have a hat and a hat band and gloves. So she wanted them to be dressed the same. But then her big quest, she goes on to say to my brother, John Barker Church of the city of New York in America, the squire, the sum of 300 pounds um, to... Um, Mrs. Angelica Church, his wife, the sum of £250, to my nephew Philip Church of New York, his squire, for his own use and disposal, the sum of £100 a year in annuities, and to my nephew um, um, John Barker Church, um, to my niece and god doctor Elizabeth Church of New York, for her own use and did to. Uh, for ditto, that's another hundred pound and a thousand pound bank stock to my nephew Richard Church of New York and a hundred pounds of the capital stock of my London insurance. And then in a short coda, so, uh, she, she actually said she made a mistake and she wanted to give Philip Church, John Barker Church's, um, she intended to give um, John Barker Church's eldest son, Philip, um, um, not a hundred pound a year in annuities, but a lump sum of a thousand pound. And then in her memorandum, she writes to Philip Church, um, she left uh, my cluster diamond ring and, and all works that they have. Um, they being abroad promised him and the miniatures of my uncle to John Barker Church, my encyclopedia and um, Rapin's History of England, to Catherine Church, the diamond ring with my sister's hair, and the miniature of my fa of her father, and the bracelet shaped and made out of our father's and my sister's hair, to Elizabeth Church, these are all the children of John Barker Church, my um, a diamond necklace and bracelet. 
and if she or her sister are married, um, the instructions were to send any silver plate to them you think useful. So this is John Barker Church's sister. So despite um, what short biographies have been written about John Barker Church, um, his antecedents in Lowestoft have been um, very much, um, I wouldn't say overlooked, they just haven't been researched at all. So he is um, a real um, Lowestoft boy, possibly a Yarmouth boy, but certainly um, his story is a fascinating one. I haven't quite finished it. We just need to push on uh, to the next slide, please. I see time is slipping away as usual. So these are actually John Barker Church's flintlock dueling pistols um, made by uh, Wogden, uh, that's Robert Wogden of London, who's one of the uh, city's leading gunsmiths um, in the 18th century. And it's pretty certain that John Barker Church must um, uh, pick those, bought those in, um, uh, although they're called, um, we call them dueling pistols today, they were made for that purpose. Uh, but they weren't actually described as dueling pistols, and they are still in existence. Um, here they are um, uh, in an exhibition in uh, New York um, not many years ago. I didn't take this photograph, by the way, um, but they are still in existence. Um, and that's a close-up of these two very very and if you look closely on the plate if you can see if you've got a big enough screen you can actually see the name Walkden. Um so these are the pistols and they still exist and um, when I was in New York um, I think it was three years ago now um, um, I managed to find out where they're stored who's still got them or where they are and I thought it would be sort of the highlight of my holiday, sad as it is to them. And they are, this is the um, descendant of the, this is J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. And it's here that the pistols are still stored. And uh, when I went to New York, um, I knew they were there. I assumed they'd be on display. And I went into the bank, which was very, very posh. I think I wasn't looking, I looked more like a tramp, I think, than uh, somebody using J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, as they descended um, from the Manhattan Company Bank. And um, I said, told them while I was who I was, while I was there, gave them my card and said, um, would there be any possibility of me seeing the pistols? And they said quite emphatically, uh, no. We only allow employees of this bank to see those pistols. Um, I did try and say, we, I've come a long way. I am a historian and my intentions are good, but they totally refused to let me see the pistols. So I got within the same building as the pistols, but I never got to see them. So that basically brings me to the end of um, this um, story, as I said, it's a, a different one. It's different um, in many ways that it doesn't, it strays a long way from East Anglia, from Lowestoft, but we do finish up back here. I hope you've enjoyed the talks. I hope you've enjoyed all my talks. I'm sure you have. I've enjoyed doing them. So I'm going to hand you back now to Paul while I give my throat a rest. Well, Ivan, that was incredible. Um, a real a real tour. And I wish I had some sound effects for when you said that um, John Barker Church was, uh, or his dad was native to Lowestoft. I would have loved to have played the dum 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 because that was a real shocker. Um, same, the same goes for uh, when when you revealed the connection to the Pacey family. That was um, that 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 wasn't something I was expecting, although. Jerry Poole says, I knew where that connection was going. Yeah, yeah. As soon as well, I saw would, that Jerry. Pacey name. <laughs> yeah, she would. Someone was on to you, if, if not me, um, I have to say. Um, now we have a message from Charlie Moore. She says, really interesting. Ivan. You, Merry Charlie. Christmas to you too. And 
Kevin Fox says, evening to everyone. Hope all well in whatever tier you may be in. Well, I think we're all right so far, Kevin. Um, thanks, mate. Hope you're you're well as well. Hazel Rumble. Hi, everyone. Happy Christmas to you all. Thank you for all the great stories and history you have given us through these past months. I'm going to miss them. Thanks again, Ivan. And obviously, we, we echo I that sentiment. Thank you so much. As well. Now, Chris Collins, it was very interesting. Yeah, Fancy not letting oh. you see the pistols. <laughs> You've been incredible. Well, what a shame. But um, I guess uh, much like money, you don't um, you, people with money don't lose it by uh, by sharing it with others quite often, do they? So um, I, I, I guess they were keeping what they had under under wraps. Linda Boy says, thank you, Ivan. Really enjoyed all the talk. Thank you, Linda, talks. for Come your support. I know you've been one of uh, one of my regular um, watchers, listeners. I don't know what you call them, but thank you. And um, you just um, take care of there, Stay safe. And um, one and all, while I think of it, have a really, really good Christmas, a Merry Christmas, as merry as you can make it anyway. And um, more importantly, not just a happy, but fingers crossed, a much healthier new year. Yeah, we could all do with some good health and good luck and good fortune, couldn't we? Um, now, Nick Dwyer, he's the skipper on the Excelsior, uh, the, the fabulous charity, the Excelsior Trust. Uh, do give them a look because uh, they do some fantastic work, not just in keeping such a, a wonderfully historic vessel in in sailing condition um but 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 also sailing it and also giving young people the opportunity to learn and be educated on on the ways of sailing it really is a fantastic charity of which nick is the skipper on 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 board that vessel he says ivan an enormous amount of work and preparation thanks and i i would i would certainly um back you up on that nick I, I i can only imagine how much work goes into these presentations and 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 this one was was very very um bespoke it was freshly prepared for you all and uh, hot, thanks, hot thanks the oven. for your support and, mate. thank um, you that's a pleasure yeah he's a lovely lovely chap um he also posted a link to the wikipedia page oh, for the magdalene yeah. asylum i had never got round to seeing what that was so but i just bunged it in there for the look of it If anybody is interested, uh, do do go to uh, the the link that we've we've displayed here at the bottom of the page uh, that Nick has very kindly added into the comment section: wikipedia.org/wiki/magdalene_asylum. Um, who else do we have? Um, we have my mate James right now. I've known James since we were nippers, and uh, he's a lovely oh, guy. Um, I'm sure I you've known him, him as well for, for a long time. He, who can get yeah. Um, He's a lovely guy. He really is. Thank you, Ivan. Another interesting, very interesting talk. Hopefully more of the same at some point in 2021. Merry Christmas to you and to Paul and Merry Stephen. Christmas, you James. too, James. Same Merry to you. Christmas, Stay mate. safe, mate. Now, uh, Kevin Fox uh, comes in again. He says, thank you both for another enjoyable evening. Best wishes to you both for the new year. Hopefully you can put together some more evenings. Yeah. It is much thank appreciated. You. I'm sorry, Ivan. There's, yeah, have you got time for me to keep going through these comments? Because a lot of people want to wish you a, a, a lovely Christmas, such as Chris Collins is saying, wishing you all a Merry Christmas, cool Yule, and a Thank much you, better Chris. and safer 21. Sue Day, um, a, a wonderful lady um, that I know from the Rogue Shanty Chorus, and she has a she has many many interests, and history is just one of them. She says, "Thank you, Ivan. Merry Christmas to everyone. It's been my for pleasure. All 12 Sue. Thanks. Days of Christmas." Jerry Paul comes in with, as always, Ivan, a wonderful talk. I shall certainly miss these talks. Thank you, everyone who is involved in doing these. Well, thank you, Jerry. Um, and we'll certainly, as I said, we endeavour to uh, continue or to at least <clears throat> um, uh, be able to provide some kind of, of, of continuation of this at some point next year. It may take us a little while, so do bear with us. Look for us on our Facebook pages, Rogue Shanty Chorus or the Rogue Shanty Boys, or the voice cloud, or you can find us, you can find all of these episodes actually on the Facebook pages and on the YouTube channel. Just search for Rogue Shanty Chorus. And as I said, we're, 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 
we're certainly hoping to bring you something in the new year um, at some point. And, and it, just to continue with with the engagement that we that we found, so many people absolutely hanging on on these presentations of of Lersoft history sessions with Ivan Bunn. And um, anybody that that would that has enjoyed them, anybody that uh, would like to see something continue in this provision, I would in, I would urge you to write us a little message on the Facebook Messenger. Uh, or even send us an email at contact at thevoicecloud.co.uk. You can send us a message just saying any any kind of supportive statements that that you have felt about about the history sessions and and how how you've you've engaged with them, what kind of impact they've had, what what kind of company they've kept you in during these these really strange months, and um, and we can put those to people that might be interested in funding something moving forward. Now, Diana Carver says, what an interesting talk again. Thanks for this and all the other ones. Happy Christmas to you all and hopefully a yeah, happy, you, healthy Diana. new year. You too, Diana. And one last thing to mention, um, uh, I, I know you've all enjoyed these history sessions and you've, you've, you've supported us very well. If you'd like to support it further, as, as I mentioned, you could send us a message with, with some kind of testimonial almost. Um, but even beyond that, um, why don't you consider popping down to Waterstones and Lernsoft or perhaps uh, dropping an order into your local bookshop to see if they can get you a copy of these books, The Trial of the Lernsoft Witches, a facsimile of the original report of the trial of Amy Denny and Rose Callender, 1662, featuring a foreword by Ivan Bunn and edited by Henry Baker. Now, obviously, that ties in rather neatly with what we was, what Ivan was uh, mentioning regarding the fam the familial connection to uh, the Paces, and they were involved in the Lowestoff or the trial of the Lowestoff witches. And also, there's this book, A Return to Haunted Lowestoff, by Ivan Bunn and Henry Baker, featuring where witches once walked, the complete story of the Lowestoff witches. So you can support Ivan in that way. You could also um, now Ivan uh, has been known to put on talks history talks uh, at the uh, lowsoft seagull theater uh, among other fine fine venues so keep a watch out uh, anytime that we find out that ivan is out and about as soon as he's able to to get places and put on these talks we'll share them on our page if you if you follow follow that page you should be able to see where and when you can enjoy uh, hopefully an in person face to face talk with ivan bun much along these lines if 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 um if and when we well, ever get out if i can just say um, Paul, um, um i was down um at the seagull um doing another presentation with the john ward band a short while ago and um, i had been asked to um oh, yes. put some stuff together for next year um as well so there should definitely be some more stuff coming mm -hmm. up Now, I remember you did one um, just after the first lockdown at Seagull, when, when the Seagull were opening their doors wide again to let people back in in a socially distanced way. And I must say, they 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 have moved mountains to make that venue as, as COVID secure as is possible. And and Ivan, uh, Ivan actually put on two historical talks and they both sold out immediately. So please don't wait. If you see the opportunity to see the man in the flesh, don't delay book your tickets get there yeah, because of course they, the other thing is as well coffee. because of the re the reduced seating i think most seats there um mm. they can sell now I, I think it's but between 35 and 40 seats instead of they got capacity i think uh, am i right in saying just short of 100 but yeah. No, yeah. it's 112 right. they can seat normally but apparently yeah. because of they but have to keep a row between rows empty row and then you've got to keep two empty mm. seats between different parties uh it restricts it down to i think uh, probably yeah. a max of 40. so um it and it not, not just for anything that i do but certainly any time if you see something at the seagull um uh, certainly they really do need our support and help um if you see something um, that you think you'd like um, get in there quick otherwise you won't get a seat because of the all the social distance and, and what have you. Mm. Well, it, all that remains to say is is a, 
a thanks to our sponsors and a thanks to you, Ivan. Uh, you've you've really kept us entertained. As you can see um, up on that side of the screen, this is episode number 23. Ivan has presented 23 different episodes to you on the Lowestoft History Sessions based in, in and around Lowestoft. This one has taken us as far as New York and then snapped it straight back to Lowestoft and Great Yarmouth again. Um, he's presented with, with fantastic... Fantastic, interesting topics and themes in such a way that, we, well, th this has grown and grown. Um, it, as, I, as I said earlier, I can only ask that if you've enjoyed it, please send us a message to let us know how much we can use your words as, as one of the public to, to show to funders how much this means to people and how important it is to keep it going. Uh, our funders at the moment, as you can see at the bottom of the page here, is the People's Health Trust. The Health Lottery East, they've been funding this so far, so far for 23 episodes and we're very grateful to them for their support and help. And um, who knows what the future will bring, but hopefully 2021 will uh, enable us to bring you even more of these Lowestoft local history sessions. And uh, one final message from Chris Collins who says, thanks Ivan et al, missing you already and we've booked for you a talk next. Well, Oh, for, for next year. So, so they're already available, are they, tickets? Oh, yeah, so this is um, uh, one that um, um, Chris has asked me to do. Um, oh, okay. I can't even remember the date off the top of my head now. But, yeah, but um, that will be, uh, I think, um, I'm right in saying, Chris, that it will be, um, 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 there will be limited tickets available for the public if they want to come to it. But Kirk, uh, Chris will have all the... Sure. The Chris, if you let us know when when tickets are available and and if they're open to the public, we can share it on on our Facebook page. So so it's am I right in saying Ivan that you're available? You're a gun for hire, um, and you're available if, if, if someone has it belongs to a local society or or, or some sort of group um, for for a fee because um, we we all have to eat. Uh, Ivan would be available to present something rather wonderful for you and your organisation. Just call it Have Laptop Will Travel. Yeah, absolutely. Ivan, once if I could shake your hand, I would. But thank you very much, my man. It's been a real okay. pleasure. And you, mate. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Have a ha healthy, happy Christmas, and we'll see you all in 2021. Yeah. If you're available, come join us for Rogue Shanty Chorus Shanty Sessions tomorrow night, right here, 7:30. Good night, everyone. Take care. Good night. <laughs>